Sing, O goddess, the anger of Achilles and the ambition of Schliemann. This series is brought to you by A Total War Saga, Troy, a brand new strategy game which dives into the legendary conflict between the kingdoms of Troy and Mycenaean Greece. Stick around until after the episode to learn how you could get the game for free. A thousand ships sail into the wine-dark sea. They are headed for Troy, across the Aegean and up the coast of the Dardanelles. For ten years, they will encamp there, sieging the great city. Never winning, but never being driven back to the sea. Even their landing was filled with tragedy, for the first to set foot onto Trojan soil was fated to be the first to die. None would even get off their ships, until Odysseus leapt from the decks, only to land on his shield and let the man who followed him be cut down. For nine years, while Troy itself stood impregnable, the mightiest of the Greeks, Achilles, laid waste to the countryside, seizing town after town, island after island, looting any place not guarded by Troy's high walls. And the plunder of Achilles was not limited to gold and silver or wine and fine cloth. No, captives, as slaves or ransom, were also one of the spoils of war. But Achilles' very victories proved his downfall and were a point of strife for all of the Greeks. For among his captives was the beautiful Briseis. And over her, he and Agamemnon, commander of the Greek forces, squabbled. In a petulant rage, Achilles said that he and his men would no longer fight for the Greeks. So they sat in their tents as a great battle ensued. At first, the Greeks gained ground, pushing the Trojans almost to the walls of their city. But then the Trojans rallied and forced the Greeks back and back. Eventually, they were on the point of overrunning the Greek camp, of burning the boats that were the only way the Greeks had to ever get back home. The Greeks begged Achilles to rejoin the battle, but he, still enraged, refused. So Patroclus, the young comrade and partner of Achilles, donned Achilles' armor and strode into battle himself. All the world thought he was the mighty Achilles, and the Trojans fell back. But even as the Greek forces charged the very walls of Troy, they were struck with yet another tragedy, for Patroclus himself was slain. Achilles, now bursting with rage, rage of which even today we sing, took up a new set of arms arms forged by the very gods themselves, and he became an avatar of slaughter. The Trojans fled to their city, but their prince was caught outside the great walls. His name is Hector, and covered in the gore of his fallen foes, Achilles has trapped him. Hector flings his spear, but it lodges in Achilles' shield, and he just shrugs it off. So the last prince of Troy offers up one final prayer and draws his sword. And now death, grim death, is looming up beside me. No longer far away. No way to escape it now. Well, let me die. But not without struggle. Not without glory. No, but in some great clash of arms that even men to come will hear of throughout the ages. He charges. The fight is fierce, but brief. He falls before Achilles, who ties him to his chariot and drags the body before the Trojan walls. But Achilles' glory will be brief as well. For though he killed many more of the defenders of Troy, he was at last slain when an arrow pierced his heel. And so the battle was at a standstill, until at last the ever-crafty Odysseus offered up a plan. It was a desperate gambit, but it had been ten years, and the men longed for home. So he offered them one final chance at victory. They would build a great horse of wood, and leave it for the Trojans as a surrender offering, and then burn their camp and set off for home. But this would be no true surrender, for their ships would wait at a nearby island, and inside the horse would hide a small group of hand-picked men. Once the Trojans had brought the horse inside their walls, at midnight the men would slip out of the horse's belly and fling open the gates as their fleet returned with Greeks desperate for one final conquest. And it worked. The Trojans saw the burning camp and brought the horse into their city. They spent the last night in a great celebration and revel, but when midnight came, the Greeks were upon them, and at last, Troy fell. Of course, that's all just a myth, or so we thought, until 1871, a remote site in Anatolia. An eccentric German is fixated with the idea of finding Troy. His name is Heinrich Schliemann, and there's really no other way to put this. He's the wildest sort of character. During the Crimean War, he cornered the market on saltpeter and made a literal killing. He had purchased land in Indiana for three months, just so he could claim to live there to make it easier for him to divorce his wife. 
During the California gold rush, he set up a bank that bought gold. Then when the Rothschilds mentioned that all of his gold deliveries were a little short, he said, Oh, well, I'm feeling a wee bit ill. And then legged it back to Europe. He published a, quote, first-hand account of the San Francisco fire while he was in Sacramento. And he said he acquired U.S. citizenship the day California became a state, though he was actually in St. Petersburg at the time. Most importantly, though, he was rich enough to retire at 36 and was also fascinated by the stories of ancient Greece he had read as a boy. Now, how obsessed are we talking here? Well, let's just say he named his kids Andromache and Agamemnon. <laughs> oh, yeah, he was that type of guy. So off he went to Anatolia, where Troy was vaguely believed to have been. And then he started to dig. Where? Well, to understand that, you have to understand one of the great leaps forward in archaeology. Somewhere between the late 18th and early 19th century, someone got around to asking, why are there all these little weird hills in Greece and the Middle East? Then realized the reason was that they were actually the ruins of ancient cities. Now today, we call these tells. And they're basically made by human beings living on a spot for hundreds or thousands of years. Human garbage, especially mud bricks, slowly raised the surface level of an area. And couple that with the fact that many of these early settlements were built on small rises for defensive purposes anyway. And these mounds turned out to be a great indicator of where an ancient city might be, along with its treasure. And because people like treasure so much, they started digging up these weird hills, and thus archaeology was born. Okay, I kid. But really, it's not that far off, especially in Schliemann's case. So, armed with only vague hints from ancient stories and some academic conjecture, he started digging up basically every hill he could find in the region, but no luck. Then, he ran into an Englishman named Frank Calvert, and Frank was pretty sure he knew where Troy was, because he had bought it. Yeah, it was on his estate. Unfortunately, though, he wasn't rich and really didn't have the money to excavate it himself. So he and Schliemann came to a deal. He would let Schliemann dig on his land, so long as Schliemann cut him in on the fines. So, Schliemann hired a hundred or so local laborers, broke out the pickaxes and shovels, and went to town on a mound called Hisarlik. At first, nothing. But then slowly, ruins started to emerge. Was this it? Was this Troy? It just might be. But then, a twist. As the workers continued to dig, they found a second city below the ruins of the first. Ancient site built on ancient site? This must be a pretty important location. It's gotta be Troy. Schliemann knew he'd found it, but it must be at the bottom. Troy had been one of the oldest cities after all, so logically it would be buried all the way down. Put down them shovels, boys. It's time for the dynamite. We're doing archaeology. Yep. In his excitement, Schliemann used the time-honored archaeological method of blowing the living daylight out of the site with TNT. In fact, one archaeologist would later say he did more damage to Troy than the Greeks ever could. But he did get there, finally, to one of the lowest levels. And there, glinting in the ground, was something gold. He dismissed the workers and brought over his wife. Then they carefully, meticulously, excavated this part themselves. And wrapped in her shawl, they carried away Priam's treasures. The artifacts of the last Trojan king. Or, you know, at least that's what Schliemann told the press. His wife had actually been around a thousand miles away in Athens, but blowing up all those layers had been worth it. He'd indisputably found Troy, there on the lowest level of the Hisarlik Mound. Except... Troy was actually five levels up. The artifacts he found were actually about a thousand years too old, and he'd blown right through the Homeric Troy trying to get to them. But hey, all that press did get the Ottoman government to pull his permits, sue him for the gold, and create an international dispute, which lasts all the way to today, due to Schliemann promptly smuggling the gold out of the country because, of course he did. For all that, though, most modern scholars now seem to agree that he, or rather Frank Calvert, got the location right. And there, on level 6 or 7, lies the site of the real Troy. So does that mean the stories of the Trojan War are true? Not by a long shot. But there probably was a historical war fought somewhere in there. Did it include a thousand ships? Seems unlikely. Did it have gods flying around and big fake horses to end the thing? Probably not. But Troy probably did exist and probably was really raised to the ground. So with all that in mind, what would that war really have looked like? Well, join us in a few weeks as we delve into how Bronze Age War really worked and the sometimes hilarious errors that Homer made in describing it. 
I'm not gonna lie, I've been incredibly psyched about a Total War Saga Troy since it was first announced. And with this being the first time the award-winning series is set in the Bronze Age Mediterranean, exploring all ten years of the Trojan War from the perspectives of the Trojans and the Greeks, I'm pretty much over Olympus that they're sponsoring this episode. Not only is the gameplay a blend of grand, turn-based empire management and spectacular real-time battles, but also a little like this episode. It fuses the history of the war with exciting new takes on the mythology of the period. Sup, Minotaur! Plus, with a huge campaign map spanning 200 settlements and 8 playable heroes, including Hector and Achilles, playing this game might even make Zeus jealous. And he was there. But most mind-blowing of all, you can get a Total War Saga Troy absolutely free on the day of its release, August 13th, 2020, via the link below. Of course, if you are watching this before then, you can always use the link to add the game to your wishlist, and you'll be on the battlefield before you know it. Well, hello there, Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Muscia, Dominic Valenciana, Gunnar Clovis, Kyle Murgatroyd, and Oreals1. Thanks so much for being legendary patrons. 